Okay, just waiting for a few more people to, to come in. Um, just indicate, can you, can you hear me all fine? Gavin, um, to me, Jason, can you hear me fine? Awesome. Cool, okay, we've got a lot of people coming in. Maybe just start by telling us where you're from. So give me an indication of which city, country. So I've got some sense of who's in the room. Really useful. Great, Johannesburg, yes, cool, Cape Town. Come on, there must be some, I think there's a few who registered from Tanzania, from Kenya, Are you here yet? Accra, fantastic. Keep it coming, the cloudy city of Johannesburg, shame. It's a beautiful day in Cape Town today, a little bit windy, but beautiful day in Cape Town. Who else we got? Move this so it's not so, so far off my line of sight. Victoria, fantastic. Okay, give you a little bit more time. What time are we now? So it's just a couple of minutes by. So we'll conscious of those of you who have arrived on time. Thank you very much. We'll just give it a couple more minutes for those few who are struggling to get in or connect. So what else have we got? Welcome, is it Fululela? Fulu, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Welcome. To me, Nana, Gavin, welcome, Jason, Elsie, Sally, fantastic. Good to see you here. Maleka, awesome. Okay, we'll just give it a couple more minutes. Okay, I think we'll, let's kick into it. And then as people join, um, we'll be doing the introductions for the first couple of minutes anyway, so they can just join and pick up as we get going. So this session today is specifically geared towards introducing you to what we call the Applied Directorship Program. So this is the CERDAR's sort of flagship program, 11 month program that we've taken a number of years to build and has been in fruition of, of our learning over at least 10 years that we've now brought into this program and brought into the book Traversing the Avalanche. So that's the specific focus of today. What I want to do is cover a little bit more, a little bit of foundational stuff at the beginning, just to set the scene and really talk about the why. So why is a board important? Why are directors important and what is their, their role before we go into the details of the training program, really just to try and set, set the context, I suppose, is the um, best way of putting it. So who is Sirdar quickly? So CERDAR is a leader in education, appointment and guide of high performance boards, mostly focused on privately held and family businesses, but we do a lot of work now with um, state owned enterprises, with large NGOs, um, bigger corporates. So definitely a, a, there's been more demand in, in the last couple of years for education programs, particularly in board evaluations. So we've moved into that space a lot more than we did historically, but we found that our learning with private held and family businesses um, has really set us in good stead and that that learning and those best practices are absolutely applicable in other organizations of other sizes and then most recently we've added contribution compass to the portfolio which is our profiling tool and onboard which is the software package we um, promote or we recommend for running electronic board meetings which has been immensely valuable as we've all moved online um, in the post-covid period so what drives me, I suppose, and we'll talk a little bit more about where I've come from, just so you've got some context, and then I'll put up a poll to find out a little bit more about who we've got in the room. But what drives me and what drives our organization is, is this concept of great directors changing lives. So there's lots of good directors out there and they're growing companies, but our fundamental assertion is that 
if you've got great directors, you can have a much bigger impact and you can really change lives. And coming out of the sort of towards the back end, hopefully, but fingers crossed back end of this COVID epidemic or pandemic, I think we really need to be much more focused on how are we changing lives for the better? How does our organization and how do we as individuals um, actually improve the lives of the populations and communities that we're working in and the lives of the general stakeholders that are involved in our company. So employees, suppliers, clients, et cetera. How do we help them grow economically? How do we help them grow and support them to have better lives in whatever aspect that our company's um, products and services can, can impact it? So a little bit about me. So if you've picked up, there's a, a not entirely South African accent. I'm originally from the UK, I'm born and bred, went to university in the UK, and then eventually arrived in South Africa in 1992. And I've been based in Cape Town since 1994. So my name is Tim Holmes. I'm a senior partner of Serdar Group, and I've been with Serdar specifically since 2013. I'm working on a number of boards. And we added it up yesterday. I think I've been on six or seven boards. Um, in the last few years, and at the moment, I'm currently chairman of four. And uh, again, a lot of the what I'll be talking about today is, will be examples and stories that I've of the boards that I've sat on, and my personal experience of the importance of independent chairman and having an independent perspective within the boardroom environment, and obviously the training as well. So let's get a little bit of about you. I'm just going to raise a poll, launch the poll. And what I'm trying to find out really is, is your context. So we're specifically, as I said, talking about our applied directorship program. So in your context, are you a shareholder manager, which means you're carrying all three hats of the shareholder director and manager? Are you an executive director as well? Um, so if you're carrying all three hats, then, then I would assume that you'd be an executive director as well, but you might not necessarily be a non-executive director. So please give indicate if you're a non-executive director and specifically towards the end of as you inspiring non-executive director, because that's obviously um, a really, really important reason to get up to speed, do some training is if you want to move into that space. You, it's vital that you know what you're letting yourself in for, but also what you're going to do when you get in the room for the first time as a director. Great. Uh, we've got about halfway, 50%. Come on. Last few. Just to click a couple of clicks to the button, please fill in the poll, just so I can get a sense of who I'm talking to, and then hopefully maybe um, move the, the conversation in that direction, talk to your requirements more specifically. Cool. Couple more. Great, thank you very much. So it looks um, good to see. We've got quite a significant portion of the room is non-executive director or aspiring non-executive director, which is great because obviously that's the kind of um, the, the individuals that we're, this program is targeted at. So it's great to see, thank you. And just move that out of the way, sorry. Move my screens around here. And whilst we're going through this, Put it in the chat box, write it in a question, or just write it on a piece of paper next to you um, as we get started. In doing this or sitting through this webinar and listening to me for the next half an hour, 40 minutes, what is the question that you want to answer? So that at the end, if I haven't answered it in going through the content, then at least you can chase me and we can do uh, some feedback and answer your specific question. So please make a note of it now whilst it's still fresh in your mind. Why are you on this webinar? And what is the question that you specifically want answered to make sure that we don't, we don't miss it? Um, and by all means, uh, throw things in the chat box during the session. Um, I've got it open in front of me. And if it's relevant to answer that question in the moment, then I'll certainly make every effort to do so. So the, what I really want to set the scene is start with the end in mind, as Steve Covey said. So what are the important components of a board and how do you measure really whether a board is actually performing properly? And we have very specific um, things that we look at um, in terms of the board's performance to determine whether we believe there's a high probability of becoming high performance um, and whether we've got high performing directors that are in the room because they have a clear understanding of what their roles and responsibilities are. So high performance board, what is it comprised of? So three main elements really, and, and we, 
in my experience of being and living on the other side, in other words, being on a board, running a board, being a chairman on a board, um, I found these three elements are critical. And if one of them is missing, then it just makes the whole process of getting real value from the board that much more difficult. So the obvious one is directors. We need directors on a board, otherwise we don't have a board. But it's the quality of the directors. Are they the right directors for this company, for this team? We're building a team. So it's the team of directors, but it's also a backup team. So you've got two teams, at least two teams at play in making a board really effective because you've got an executive management team that are supporting the MD or CEO who's sitting on the board. Now, if that team don't understand how a board process works, if that team don't understand how information and communication should be flowing between them and the board and back again, then again, the board's not likely to be effective. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec, but the, the key role of an executive manager, no, ex yeah, executive full stop, is to be able to present the information in such a way that the board can assimilate it and can assimilate it quickly. So it's got to have a highlight. It's got to have context. It's got to have recommendations. So SIDAR so over the last uh, the years has, has developed a few templates to try and make that easier and make that a little bit quicker to implement. But the fundamentals are, if we were doing an executive summary for anything else, what would we need to include? Who is it from? Who is it to? What, what is the title of it? Why is it on our plate as a board in the first place? What are the things that have been considered up to now? So obviously information paper, decision, discussion paper, decision paper, they may be different. And then if it's a discussion paper, what are you recommending? So I've got a context from the person who came up with this paper, who's presumably done some research on this topic, and they're giving me an understanding as a director and this is critical if I'm an independent director because I don't have an operational perspective. They're giving me an understanding of why this paper is important, what I should look out for, and what are we hoping to achieve at the end of the day. And then we're moving on to a decision paper, even more important. So that's where the methodology piece starts to come in, is what is the process of the board? Do we have pre-board meetings or not? How do we build board, board papers? So have we got specific templates we use to get us going? What do we have in our board papers? Do we have a management a report or a managing director report? Do we have a CFO report or is it just profit loss and income statement and, and balance sheet? What are the components of our standard set of board papers? What does the agenda look like? What order is it in? Does it start with strategy? Does it, or does it start with minutes and matters arising? What is the potential impact of, of starting it that way, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where that methodology piece becomes absolutely critical is making sure that all of the pieces of the puzzle are in sync and have been thought through and are then followed through. So the board over time becomes more and more and more effective. So if you've got the right directors in the room, you've got a team that actually, they're acting as a team as directors, but they've got the team backing them up that's supporting, providing the right information at the right time, and then taking the decisions and implementing them effectively, and then the methodology that holds it all together, then you've got a far higher probability of having a really um, effective board. So the question is, what is one key area? What is one key area that an inspiring director could begin to work on prior to becoming one? So the, it even says it in the Companies Act that you need to train yourself. You need to be educated. You continuously educate yourself. So for any director, if you don't have any training in being a director, do something, read a book, do an institute director's course, do one of our courses, but do something because you need to get at least to a base level of understanding what your roles and responsibilities are. And then if you want to go to the next level and really become professional director or it becomes this is part of your portfolio or is part of your career development then really your only choice is is the applied directorship program i know it sounds like um you know singing our praises but realistically in the market we've struggled to find anything else that's effective in training the practical aspects of being the director and that's really is the you know whether 
the rubber hits the road. It's not just the theory, it's how do you apply it? And that's really what we've, we've built this program on is to make sure you fully understand roles and responsibilities in the room, but then how do you implement what you know and how you implement the law and how do you implement these processes and methodology to be effective? So this is a definition, this is our definition, and there's some um, various comments have come back about whether it's just meaningful economic impact. So in, in my mind, particularly economic impact means anything where it's benefiting someone in, in terms of rand in their pocket or an improvement in their um, lifestyle or their um, status of their, of, of their general life. So it may not be directly in RAND, it might be something that helps enhance their life and makes them more comfortable or gives them more opportunities, etc. But ultimately, that'll have some kind of economic impact down the line. If that individual becomes has opportunities that are available, then they're more likely to become a revenue generator for that family and a salary, which means that's going to have a broader impact on the community, etc. So I, I see that economic impact is, is much broader. It's not just simply um, money per se, it's anything that helps improve that community's um, opportunities and, and uh, living standards. So it's obsessed with creating meaningful economic impact. So this is not a half-hearted, I'll, I'll do it when I feel like it. It's not, I'm only going to engage when I'm in the board meeting. And a lot of companies only have four board meetings or even sometimes less, but legally should be having four board meetings a year. If you're having four board meetings a year, what are you doing in between? Are you obsessed with creating meaningful economic impact? What are you doing and how are you engaging with the company to try and drive that forward 24 seven? And the role of the board and the role of the company plays in the economy. And such a director is not afraid to have the tough conversations so those of you who are aspiring to be a non-executive director, this is the piece where you really add value because often the family members or the founders who've been together for years don't have those tough conversations. They need that push. They need that accountability as well as do the mundane tasks. So board meeting prep is pretty mundane. It, it's quite boring and there's a lot of paperwork and it's, there's a lot of drudgery, but you have to commit to that in order for the, the board to become successful and for you to be a, a participant in that board's success. So read that paragraph, think about the content in that paragraph because it's really important to understand these are all of the things you need to be thinking about and doing and acting on as a high performance director. And if any of these components are missing, then you're not going to be truly effective. And likewise for a board, it's one that through its rhythm, so we talked about that rhythm of the methodology, how does it make decisions? So have you got well-structured board papers that help you make a decision? Excuse me. Holds the company accountable to a performance standard higher than it's ever been held before. So if a company has been led by a founder, Often what happens is it becomes their family. And there's definitely a dip, if, even if you reach that, there's definitely a dip in accountability. And then resulting increasing value, improved return for shareholders and other stakeholders on a sustainable basis. So what are we doing to improve the returns? Because money comes from, from shareholders, obviously. Broader context stakeholders, so community, all of those kind of things. And on a sustainable basis, because we want to make sure this company's around in not just three months, but three years or 30 years or 300 years. So what are we doing to try and make sure that we're not overstretching, that we're not um, falling into like flatlining or, or busy dying because we're holding onto a cash code, we're not coming into innovation, et cetera. So what are we doing as a board to drive that um, focus on sustainability? And this is a nice diagram that one of my colleagues, Roger Hitchcock, came up with, uh, I think last year, which really is trying to illustrate the power of the boardroom and the director on impacting company performance. So company performance is the heavy weight on the end of the lever. So the longer straight line is, is a lever. The boardroom triangle is, a, is the pivot and the director is applying force on that, on that lever 
through that pivot to try and move company performance. So if you have strong directors, capable directors, well-trained directors, then obviously they're going to be able to apply more force to that lever. But if the boardroom construction composition, that's not kept fresh, it's getting stale, then it's not going to be as strong as it could be, which means you have nothing to leverage on. So having a really capable individual director is not going to have very much impact on an organization compared with a really effective team of directors working in the boardroom and understanding their role impacting the company performance and covering all areas of that enterprise um, governance compass, which I'll show you in a second. So it's, just think about that. It's, you cannot have a missing piece. If you don't have strong enough directors, there's, you're not going to be able to leverage no matter how strong the boardroom concept is. If, if, you, if you have a strong boardroom, then you need to have both strong boardroom and strong, strong directors to really make a difference. But if you've got both and they're regularly updated and they're kept strong and they're kept fit in that context, then we can have a much bigger impact on company performance. And we've seen that with some of the companies during COVID where profits have gone up a factor of 10 times to proper money where shareholders and, and founders are, are getting proper dividends, which they've never been able to pay themselves before. So really, really affecting company performance um, quite um, significantly. So leadership governance is continual work in progress. Please bear that in mind. This is not a learn it once, forget. This is ongoing, continuous revision, continuous education, continuous research for if you're a leader and specifically if you're a leader on a board. This is not something you do, you're done. This is you get to a point and you try and take it to the next level and you try and take it to the next level. It's about practical implementation, implementation, relearning, unlearning some of the things which aren't helpful and then moving forward and practical implication and relearning, et cetera, et cetera. So foundations very quickly, just to understand the concept the craft is a business which is based on the founder's skill and ability, like a master craftsman, and enterprise is built based on the concept of team. So we are talking about directors operating in an enterprise context. If the organization understands that they need to shift from a craft mindset because they're being limited by the skills and abilities of that founder or leader, then you have to make a distinct and strong and def definitive shift to we're now going to run this organization like an enterprise. And that's when a board becomes critical because it separates the hats, which we'll touch on in a sec, of shareholder and manager. You need a strong board in the middle to force that separation. An entrepreneur or enterprise, so just to give you some context, entre entrepreneur comes from the French word entrepreneur, which is to undertake or promise. So the entrepreneur, the founder, the person who comes up, comes up with the idea, defines what, are we, what is our undertaking? What are we doing? What are we promising to the market? If that stays with the entrepreneur, then you're in, in the craft. If you shift it across to now the enterprise delivers against that promise, now you're talking about a proper business. You're talking about a team built business. So what is the role of a director? Common misconception, it's the board and the directors drive the strategy. The CEO, MD and other members of the executive team can provide the framework for the strategy and they can even provide a large part of the detail for the strategy, but it's absolutely essential that the board drive and um, live it and then make sure it's implemented. So it's a leadership aspect as well. So what, do we really truly own the strategy? Are we leading the organization in that way by what we say, what we do? And then the governance aspect, obviously, of making sure that the, the company is being governed correctly. And what do we mean by governance? That's the policies, the procedures, that's the, the rule book that we put in place. So as a board, we shouldn't be op operationally involved, but we need to give guidelines to operations so they know what are the boundaries what are the, the rails on your um, 10 pin bowling thing? Think that things are gonna bounce around, but you wanna make sure they stay in the roles so we get towards the target. 
So what are we doing in terms of making sure that the right policies are in place and the right procedures in place to help drive the system of the organization? And just very quickly, so governance comes from Kubernetes and Kubernari, uh, Gubernari, uh, Gubernari from Latin. And the, the analogy really is, is talking, thinking about steering and piloting a ship. So this is where governance became sort of apparent. You've got shareholders who pay for the ship, build the ship. You've got the captain and the officers who drive the ship and determine where it's going to go, what its capabilities are, make compensations and changes to the route and to the destination based on weather conditions, capabilities of the ship, et cetera. And then you've got the crew, the management, who actually make sure the ship moves forward and steering it and putting the sails up and down. The important thing to remember is in that story, it's quite easy to figure out, well, as soon as the ship leaves the port, the shareholders have no influence on it. In a business context, the same applies, but we get very confused because we're wearing so many hats. And as shareholders, you meddle way too much in the operations of the business. It's a different hat, different responsibility, different role. So the three hats, we've got shareholders, we've got the board, and we've got management. Shareholders are independent. Their, their relationship with the company is very different from the board or management because they may have different numbers of shares, which means they have different voting rights. They can be employed or not employed or never have been employed. There could be a relative. There's all kinds of different reasons why someone is a shareholder. And that causes all, potentially causes lots of conflict. But there are individuals in that context. The board, however, is a team. It's a team of equals. You have an equal vote always. You should only have a leader, leader in terms of the chairman is leading the team to make them sure they're effective, but it shouldn't be a situation where the chairman has a bigger voice or has more influence than anyone else on that team. It should be, as I said, a team of equals. And it's really important to understand that's a key part of our responsibility as directors is to make sure that we have consensus. This is not a voting game. As soon as people talk about voting in a boardroom, we're missing the point. It should be absolutely exception when you're voting in a boardroom. We, we should be driving consensus because as soon as we leave the room, we have to take that idea into the organization as one voice. And management is always going to be some kind of pyramid because you lead the organization up through a single point of contact, which is a CEO or MD. And each of those have different boundaries. So shareholders have a specific set of rights. They have a right to appoint directors, they have the right to remove directors, and they have the right to get a return on their investment. And that's basically it. You cannot meddle in the strategy of the organization. You cannot meddle in the operations of the board. You've appointed the people, you give them a mandate, you give them a statement of intent to tell you what, tell the board what you want from the organization, what your expectations are as shareholders, and that's pretty much it. Whereas there's a little bit more of a fluid relationship between management and board because there's continuous communication backwards and forwards between the two, but they are still distinctly separate. So the company has a relationship with all three, and any when you form a company, you create all three. So you, if, if you're moving into the enterprise and you're not using all three of these effectively, then you're not really getting the full value of having set up a PTY. So make sure that you, as far as possible, have distinctly different group of shareholders. Even if it's just one other shareholder is not operating in the organization, it starts you to force you to think with a shareholder hat on in AGM. The, the lines become less blurred. As soon as you bring independent thought into the board, it becomes much easier to separate the hats because you've got people in the room whose only responsibility and only engagement with the company is in that particular role. And it's complicated because shareholders have a selfish relationship. So I'm expecting a return on my investment. The board has a selfless relationship. They have to do everything in the best interest of the company and management has a contract, which means they have a combination of the two. If you don't pay management salary, then it tends to kick into a selfish conversation or some kind of promises have been broken. Whereas you define as a selfless, if I've got a contract, this is my responsibilities and I need to deliver on those responsibilities. And please remember, so this is for everybody, you can't own a business because it's a juristic person. It's like a human being. Just general point, and that's always 
there's always someone in the room somewhere who's, who will push against that in most talks I've done. So if there's no one in this room, no one sticking a hand up saying they don't understand that need more detail. If you, please, if you do, please, please shout at something in the chat if you'd like me to explain that in more detail. Otherwise, just yeah, please, in your language, in the way you think about the business, please understand you can't own it. It's not my business. I'm a shareholder. I'm a director. I'm a manager. Okay, so director's duties. This is what we want to try and train in the program. Really, really key understanding is that anybody who has a significant impact on the strategy becomes a prescribed officer, which means they have the responsibilities and liabilities of a director. And the two key pieces that directors need to be aware of is care, skill, and diligence, and then the basic fiduciary duties of acting good faith, best interest of the company, not for personal gain, et cetera. So the training program tries to take you through various scenarios to make sure there's a really deep understanding of what all of these things mean and takes you through eight board meetings. So you start to practice and flex and develop those muscles of how do I apply care, skill and diligence to a board process and repeat and learn a bit more and then repeat and learn a bit more. So after eight board meetings, which in royal companies might be two years worth of board meetings, we're only doing it in eight months. You've got a really good understanding of what that rhythm feels like, what that means to really take care when you're reading the board papers and digesting them, interrogating them, etc. So it's care is the approach to decision making. Have we thought it through? Have we investigated all of the possible pitfalls? Or have we just brushed over things and made massive assumptions and moved forward? Because that's when you've got the, 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 the law or the, the a reasonable man test will say, well, were you taking care? And if you had taken care, what would you have done differently? But if you've got board papers that say, no, this is how we did the decision making, this is the things we considered. And yes, something's changed, the pandemics arrived, we hadn't got that on our list, but we tried to make sure that we'd thought of everything else, then you're gonna be in a much better position. Skills, knowledge, do the training. Make sure you have commercial acumen. Do business courses if you don't. Make sure you're doing some kind of self-development. We need high EQ. We need really mature people on the board to get best value. So do, do all of these things if you want to be a really effective director. And diligence, pay proper attention to the detail and prepare properly for the board meeting, the mundane bit. Take the half a day or the day to read the papers, to interrogate the financials, to highlight the sections that don't look right, to ask the questions in the meeting, et cetera. Because it's not just what you do, in other words, what the outcome is, it's how you got there. So as an organization and as a board, we need to be aware of this. The risk and liability is for both. So if we didn't, if we got a good outcome, great. But if we didn't get a good outcome, the first thing you're going to check is how you did it. What was your process? What was the way you reached that decision? So it's critical we do both. So Getting into the program now, the program is based on this, the management, so the governance compass. And the concept of this was trying to put in a simple, easy to visualize diagram, everything that Sirdar has learned over the last now 12 years, putting it into a diagram that explains all of the different things that you need to be thinking about as a board. So around the outside is you need to be thinking about what is the purpose of this organization. But immediately opposite of that is the sustainability. Because if you're pulling purpose too hard, too far, it's gonna have an impact on sustainability. At some point, you're gonna drive growth too, too quickly, or you're gonna drive delivery of your purpose and not realize that actually you're pushing people too hard and this whole thing's about to blow up. On the sides is the same story. If you're pushing performance, fun faster, 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 but you're not thinking, you, what tends to happen is conformance takes a shift. So we don't follow the rules quite as well as we should. We take shortcuts. You see this all in these environmental um, problems that big companies have had, where they've pushed performance, they're trying to get their quarterly returns, but they've forgotten they actually need to have safety measures and, and worry about oil spills and a few other you know, important things because the conformance bit slips. So as a board, we've got to constantly make sure these things are in balance and make sure that top and downs are balanced like a balloon. As soon as we pull one side too much, 
there's a risk that the whole thing is going to blow up or something else is going to get infected. So if, if, if nothing else, just try and visualize this football with these four forces pulling in different directions, because that's, that's the essence of what we should be thinking about as a board. And then the components of what we should be doing as a board is we have to develop a strategy and direction. We have to understand what the organizational culture should be, is, needs to be, how do we get there? We have to understand, based on the culture and the strategy, have we got the right leadership to be effective, to drive that strategy against that culture? And then we can start thinking about stakeholder engagement, shell returns, et cetera. But all eight of those components need to be dealt with at board level at least once a year. As an organization, we need to have a high level of maturity in each of those levels to be really, truly effective. Extreme, extensively recognize that governance increase the bottom line, and that's becoming more and more prevalent, more and more court cases are highlighting, et cetera. So it's really important you know how to do this stuff properly. So the Applied Directorship Program is an 11 month program, as I've said, it's designed around a four hour session per month, the online Zoom call session where you have discussions and you have simulated board meetings. Maximum 20 attendees, you want to keep the group um, small so that we can engage, so we can share experiences, so we can actually um, get a chance to talk to each other and learn from each other. And it's 11 months because we have two months to as an introduction, one for some of the stuff that I've talked about today, another month to talk about how we build a board and go through a lot of examples and then build your boards so that from month three onwards, you are put into boards. You are put into, this is company A, this is company B, this is company C, and you run board meetings in that context, all competing against each other in a simulated um, world um, based on two countries. And you start competing on uh, selling and developing your business in that, in that context. So as we're trying to make it as real as possible. And then the 11th is, was uh, by popular request that we had a sort of closeout session where the, the, the main body of the course had been done and everybody got a chance to share their experiences. How did you do better in the simulator than me? What was your experience about the particular modules, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we can close off, we can have that reflection point, we can, we can help and share each other's learnings. So that's the overall structure. And it's very much geared on the governance campus, as I've mentioned. So each board meeting covers one section of the governance campus and it's got to be practical. So you've got to do it. You've got to have a board meeting. So two hours of your four hour session for those eight months in the middle, two hours is the board meeting. You go off in your breakout rooms on Zoom and you have a board meeting for two hours. And then we come back and have some, some reflection and questions and various other things. But it's the only way we found that you can actually learn how to do this stuff is to do it. You can't, and this one, um, it doesn't help to do a mountaineering degree and expect to understand how to climb a mountain. It's the same for directors. You can read a book, but you have to actually implement it. You can do a course, but you actually have to implement it. So that's why we, we ended up through multiple mutations and realizing actually we have to have some mid board meetings if people are really going to build this muscle and really become properly high, um, high performance directors. So this is this you. Um, you run a business and you're looking to implement a board. I'm just going to move my camera across. I think you read the text. Um, implement a evaluated board. So if you were the, the um, shareholder manager, this might be you. Uh, you've taken over a family business. So we have quite a few people who do the course so in that situation, next generation, taking over a family business and looking to to be recognized in the family, that they understand how to be a director and the, the next gen, the, the older generation uh, feel a little bit more comfortable handing over, et cetera, et cetera. Looking first appointment. So those of you who had, uh, mentioned at the beginning that you were looking for a, a new appointment, first appointment, non-executive director, absolutely doing training is really key. Or you have an opportunity. So it's not even that you're looking for it. There's the opportunity, but I'm just not comfortable because I'm not sure how I'm going to add best value to the boardroom. Or you just want to develop your skills. So I've already been a non-executive director for a while, and I think this was definitely my journey. When this course was came up, I was one of the first people to, to attend it. And it was a purely selfish thing. Yes, I need to learn how the course works, 
but I wanted to improve my skills as a non-executive director and it absolutely made a difference. We moved from mostly non-executive director, um, independent non-executive director positions to independent chairman positions, just because I was that much more confident going into the room, had a lot better understanding of how this thing worked. Or you're an executive director and supporting the board process. So as I said before, it's also key that you make sure that your executive directors are properly trained because, or executives generally, because they will be driving the information and helping and supporting the board. And at some day they may become directors, but it's really important that executive directors and just executives have a much better understanding of this process if the board is really going to be effective. So give us directors who have practiced their skill and experience in the boardroom. So that's another major reason why we need to make sure you've had some practical experience so that we can talk to the companies we're dealing with and, and say with confidence, these guys know what they're talking about. These ladies know what they're talking about. And just because someone has been the chief executive doesn't mean that they know how to relate to me as a director. It's a very different skill and a very different approach if you are coming onto a board as a non-exec, if you come onto that board with a chief executive hat on, because that's your experience, you're not necessarily gonna support the incumbent CEO and D to the level you should, and you're not gonna necessarily bring the right mentorship approach to the conversation with a director hat on. It tends to become way too operational, and that's not the point. As a director, it's not operational, it's strategic. It's high level, it's policies. That's what we talked about earlier. And we want to know that you can confirm. So when they're talking to us, they want to say, okay, have you had some experience with this person? Do they know what they're doing? And then obviously having been with you for 11 months makes it much easier to do that. Um, and we've taken a view, we'll move towards it. And some of our shorter courses are definitely moving towards um, having accreditation and that kind of thing but for for now this course was based on we want to help you understand and develop the knowledge not to to do an exam and, and get a certificate so we have a CERDAR certification or certificate but it's not accredited by any university or uh, harvard or whoever it's we want to make this thing practical and real and change it as when we can to produce really good quality directors it's not in our mind about having a piece of paper we want to better demonstrate this knowledge. And one thing is really key to, to understand, and part of the reason why we built the course where we did, was being a director requires time. So if you have the time to do the course, you will have the time to do the training. I mean, to do the, to, to be a real executive director, not executive director. If you're struggling to find the time to do the training, then the likelihood is you're maybe not going to be putting in the effort, putting in the time, et cetera, that you should, commitment into the director role. So coming out of the program, you think, wow, it's tough. It's much easier to then step into the real world and implement it because it may be easier than the course, but at least you've worked out in your day-to-day -day life how you're going to manage this thing. How are you going to put aside the time to read board papers? How are you going to put a time, aside the time to have the board meetings, et cetera? So program overview. One question that comes up a lot is around what's the difference between an MBA and a CERDAR Applied Directorship program. The main thing is an MBA is geared and the CERDAR Applied Directorship program are geared at different things. So MBA is about management, about being a better manager. Applied Directorship Program is about being a better director. They're similar, the approach is very similar, even the education process is quite similar, but the outcome is very different. Having studied an MBA myself, I didn't feel like I came out of that course with a really clear understanding about how to be a director. I had a really good understanding about how to be a manager and then became one, but it didn't really help me in terms of understanding what it means and to be a director. And it's not a one week intense get it done, move on. It's we want to extend it so that we get over those dips where you start to forget things. And, and often if you do it a, 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 like a in, uh, what do you call it, in situ residential, that's the word I was grabbing for, residential course for one week, put in the time, it's very clinical. You've got very few other distractions. We want you to live this program. We want you to fit it into your daily life 
so that when you go out into the world and become a non-executive somewhere else, you're used to it. You understand how to manage it. You understand the, the conflicts and, the, and the diff how you manage your time more effectively. And it's very much theory and simulation, not just theory. So we do pieces of the, as I said, the puzzle is simulation, simulated boards, but then there's an enormous amount of online material that you have access to and expected to read and consume, which is the theory part and other examples and videos and all kinds of other things. So it's first month introduction, as I said, understanding the types of directors, so a little bit of what we touched on, three hats, et cetera, go through a few worked examples. Two is starting to think about how you put together a board. So what is the, the ways you, you know, the things you need to think about. So one of those components is contribution compass and everybody who does the program gets a contribution compass profiler. So you get a good understanding of what your profile is. And then we talk a lot about, well, how does that, when you put a group together, how does the individual profiles affect the profile of the team and the outcome of the team and what they're gonna struggle with, what the challenge is gonna be. So that that's the module two is understanding the team dynamics. And then we move into the board meeting. So your first board meeting as it was the first pie on the governance compass, we now start thinking about strategy. Now you're thinking in your team, as your company, called X whatever it is, with whatever product it is that you've decided as a cohort, that will be all your products for all the different teams. What is gonna be your strategy to outcompete the others? Are you gonna push for market share? Are you gonna push for least cost? What are you gonna do as a team to make sure that you come out at the end as being the best performing company? Moving on to organizational culture. So lots of examples, lots of videos about how important organizational culture, some worked examples in board papers, et cetera. As I said, lots of videos. And then the fifth one is chief executive performance. That's the effective teams portion. And think about how that works in practice. And again, some board papers related to that for you to work through. And then we come around the corner and in the bottom right hand corner of that, um, that circle is the stakeholder engagement. So thinking about who are all the stakeholders, what are our social and environmental responsibilities, it's not just the profit motive. Um, becoming more and more important, I think, South Africa largely has actually been leading the world in understanding the broader context. So that, that, that philosophy, that Ubuntu philosophy is, has been fantastic in bringing that awareness that it's not just how much money you make. There's so many more aspects you need to cater for and to be truly whole. So that's a major part of the stakeholder engagement. Shareholder expectations. It's important to understand what the shareholder expectations are, dividend policy, what are the So lots of examples, lots of videos, et cetera, to try and help you understand um, those concepts. And again, worked examples. Then moving on to risk. So risk and compliance is what typically people think is, is the only responsibility for your board. Um, but we go into a little bit more detail about risk matrices. How do you run it? How do you run that process within your board context? Uh, what are the different tools that are available, et cetera? And you can dig into this one topic and become a, a lifetime career if you really want to. But it's what do you need to know as a board in order to be effective? Then you move on to finance. So thinking about budgets, the concept of budgets, why are they important? Go through some examples of what kind of things you need to be looking at in terms of financial performance, investment strategies, et cetera. All of the strategic things we need to be thinking about as a board, not just looking at the P&L and say, yeah, okay, that looks fine. It's about what is the financial structure of this business? And then the last section is about a board evaluation. So we do an example where you work through the board evaluation process. So looking at your team, Let's evaluate how we performed. And the same principle would be applied to our clients on an annual basis. And it's a service we offer for companies if they're looking for it. What do you do in terms of an annual board evaluation? So you actually go through that experience and, and get a sense of, sense of the value. And as I said, then the last 11th session is really that uh, sort of checking. Um, okay, so understanding every seat is precious. So make sure you are not the one that's the lightweight, that you're really adding value. And that's why it's so important in private companies because they don't have the money to splash around on, on numerous directors. They don't have the compulsion to have particular people on their boards like bigger corporates and um, government institutions, etc. So everybody needs to know what they're doing, understand what their value is, understand how they contribute, and then really, really make a difference. 
And this is the Contribution Compass Profiler tool, and we use it on top of that Governance Compass. So this is what the Governance Compass looks like again. So you can see it's the same kind of format, um, eight sections, eight profiles. And we found that high activating energy is typically good at getting and taking strategic decisions. Um, high inspiring energy has a really clear understanding of the who, so the effective leadership aspects. Sustaining is the, really the, the, the doing. So are we making sure that we're connected with stakeholders? Are we making sure that we're keeping the, the shareholders satisfied? Have we got the processes and procedures in place? Are we looking at the risk, et cetera? And refining is that sort of risk moving into the finance aspect. So each as individuals, we have a piece of each of these four, um, and we have a, then have a dominant profile. And when you're putting together the team, putting the team together around these profiles makes it really clear that where the gap is and what the challenges might be for this group. So it's not, and one thing, please, I really, really want to emphasize this. We have a director network. We maintain a list of people who want to be directors. We have clients who are looking for independent directors, and we'll search that list and, and draw up a short list. That's absolutely possibility get on the program you will move up move higher up that list you can also get on that list today if you're not on it already but we cannot guarantee that you will get appointed to a board it's just like saying you're guaranteed a job if you do a an engineering degree we can't do that it becomes too much about the individual it becomes about the circumstances about what they where they live what their experience is etc etc so we can help and support you in any way we can but we can't guarantee um, that if you do this program you will get a director position, unfortunately. Program outcomes, so it's about reinforcing and augmenting knowledge, understanding your duties, developing an understanding of how to be effective and integrated high performance board and governance methodology, sort of the pieces we talked about before, the team and methodology. Be able to say you've experienced high performance boardroom. So you've been in a meeting. So you will have a perspective on what worked and what didn't you've been in a board meeting with effectively strangers. So what's that gonna be like if you come into a board as a non-exec? If you've lived that already, you've got some stories to tell, you've got some experience you can call on, et cetera. And it's sure a working knowledge of the essential tools. So you've been exposed to, this is a well-constructed agenda. This is why it's important to have a pre-board between the chairman and the MD and the kinds of things we need to be talking about. This is what well-structured minutes look like. And that's why a chairman needs to run the meeting in a certain way, because otherwise, if you're not summarizing things properly or sticking to the agenda, et cetera, then we're gonna get terrible minutes out the other end because the poor minute taker doesn't know what's going on. So get some idea of what the agenda looks like, have some conversations around how do you run a meeting as a chairman, the experience running a meeting as a chairman in your group, and then the follow-on as well. So, the board paper, next board papers come out, but how soon do they come out before the next meeting? What preparation do I need to do, et cetera, et cetera. So we start getting into that rhythm and make sure that we've got all the tools at hand to, to make the proper decisions. Demonstrate practical expertise in applying the methodology. So again, you've, you've lived it, you've had the board meeting, you've been through the board papers. Identify areas of, of personal directorship strengths. So this was a key for me in my experience. I realized that I actually quite enjoyed being the chairman and was actually pretty good at it. And that became a major part of what I've driven since is to make sure that I'm on the board, but as a chairman and really trying to drive and develop my skills as a chairman, because I realized that that was something I quite enjoyed. Other people in my team and on our, our course said they never want to be a chairman. It just wasn't something they were interested in. So that's a really critical understanding. Also understanding your contribution compass profile will give some understanding and idea about what your role might be on the board. Are you the person that sits there quietly, listens intently, and then just brings it all together in that key moment and adds that, that absolute nugget? Is that what you're really good at? Then practice that and then develop that and have a, develop a voice, etc. You do receive a certificate of attendance. So if you attend, at nine out of the 11, you get a certificate of attendance. So if you need that for your, for your corporate, um, you also get a, a certificate of competence. And in the organizations we're working with, it's becoming recognized as, as being valuable. But as I said, it's not accredited against any particular university. It's our certificate to say that we believe that you are competent. So if you've got no time for this, 
then I would question if you've got time to serve effectively on the boardroom. So please bear that in mind. If time is an issue, then you need to make the time. If this is important to you, you need to make the time either way because you're going to need to have that time if you're serving on the board as long exec. So 11 months, cohort, three or four boards of directors in that meeting. So if we've got a cohort of 20, then we typically have four teams of five, for example. Simulate board meetings, four hours a month. And that what's really happened and what's given us a massive opportunity with this move to online is that we now have a network across Africa of like-minded people in the room, not just a network of people in your city, in Accra or in Nairobi or in Joburg or Cape Town where we were holding the physical face-to-face -face, um, meetings before. So I invite you, join the Applied Direction so you can say, we've challenged your thinking, prove your prospects and begin your journey as a high performance director. So if you really truly want to be a high performance director, then I would highly recommend that this is one, but probably the, should be the top of the list, top one or two, but top of the list of the things you should do and try to do to make that happen as quickly as possible. So as Buffett says, best investment is in yourself. So what are you investing in yourself right now? I know it's tough times, I know cash is tight, but what is the investment in you? So in six, 12 months time, you will be a better you with better prospects, with a better company, with a stronger company, et cetera. Before we move on, I just wanna check if there's any other um, questions. So we've got one question here. Uh, I am a director for two nonprofits and need to empower myself to sit on profit making companies. Very keen to get more clarity on the difference of approach. Business versus. Good question. Um, I'm also on the board of a not-profit, non-for-profit, and working with a couple of others. And my perspective would be, as a director, your approach should be exactly the same. A not-for-profit doesn't mean it shouldn't be run like a business. It just means that it has a different profit motive. And if it makes a profit, it goes back to um, its beneficiaries. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't run it professionally. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have a strategy. It doesn't mean you shouldn't understand what your organization's culture is. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have effective leadership. And having worked with a couple of very effective charities and not-for-profits, um, my, my experience has been that the ones run themselves like a business are the ones that are effective, the ones that attract um, donors, attract whatever the, the charitable donations, whether it's grants, whether it's whatever it might be, because they're demonstrating good governance, they're demonstrating good process, they're transparent in the way they approach things, they have a really clear way of presenting what they're about, because they fully understand where they're going and what their culture is. So I would say that it's exactly the same. The only difference really is that when the money is flowing through the organization, there are different motivations. And practically, the chance of you getting high director's fees for a not-for-profit are pretty minimal. So if you want to get a little bit high director's fees, then definitely push um, towards getting some private placements. And yes, uh, we'll send you the slides as well. Any other questions? Um, just looking at the chat box here. Put your questions up, anything else? Nope. So just before we go, so if you're keen to sign up, this price hasn't changed since a year ago. It's $4497 plus plus that. The RAND's a lot stronger than it was six or seven, eight months ago. So it's a good time to, to lock, that, <laughs> lock that price in as it were. And our next cohort is on the 10th of March. So a pretty short window of opportunity to make sure that you get your your um, registration done. So 10th of March, um, aiming to fill the room. And just as a, if you've done, if you've taken the time, you've taken the time to be on this call, you've taken the time to listen to me, then we're offering you a $500 voucher towards that, that price. Um, so basically, whoever's on the attendance register for this, this uh, session. So if you fill the application form in, which you have to do anyway before the 5th of March to really 
um, get everything, all the paperwork done before the 10th, um, then we'll issue the $500 voucher, which you can use against the ADP or you can use against one of our other services, it's up to you. This is the link to register. Um, I'm just gonna put this in the chat, whoops. I'm trying to put this in the chat box. So it's bit.ly, uh, this is what it looks like. So if you go to HTTP bit.ly ADP online, fairly easy to remember, but all capitals, if you go to bit.ly ADP online, then you should get a screen that looks a bit like this, which is the registration page or um, application form, should I say, and you add in your further details. And then we've got a few questions about what do you want to get out of the program? So again, we've got some kind of context for anyone that's coming into the cohort. And then we'll also assess whether uh, you're at the point where you're really going to get value from it, um, or if you're at the level where you've got enough management experience that you're really going to be able to participate and add value to the rest of the group. So we also don't want to bring in people who aren't closer to being equals in the room. We want people who've got the potential to be directors or already directors in the room, so you can really truly share your experiences and your knowledge. Any other questions? And that's me. So if you want to get in touch with me directly or get in touch with the particular person that um, got you on this call in the first place, um, by all means, send me an email, give me a call. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I see, thank you, Maleka, who's posted the link to the form. So it's on the chat at the moment, if you want to click on it, so it takes you to that page before the chat box disappears. Thank you, everybody. Any other questions? Um, nothing coming through. Thank you very much indeed. Um, if you've got a moment, then we can just answer poll. And really, it's just so that we've got some idea. If you if you want us to follow up, um, if you want us to call you about specifically about the ADP, if you if you want just a thirty minute consult with my with myself, happy to have that call. Happy to go through what you require as a business or as an individual, just to give you some context um, or any other training options. Director network, as I said. Um, if you need details of the director network, by all means, just tick that box and we'll, we'll send you the link um, or any other board support services if you're a shareholder manager or executive director. So thank you for your time. Thank you for being on this call with me. Um, I'll leave this open for a couple more minutes. Um, but by all means, uh, if you've got any last questions, then just drop them in and I'll answer them now. So I'll stay on the call for a few more minutes. But it's three minutes past two. Sorry, I'm three minutes over. I hope that was valuable. I hope you've learned something and we really look forward to seeing you on our next Applied Directorship program. Thank you. So question to me, in terms of a special skills for directors, how would SODAR assist a client in appointing a director for a specified skill set? So that we have an appoint division. So not only do we have the director network, we also have a team that help and support companies to go through that process. So do an assessment of your business, um, have a look at what the requirements are of the specific director, and then we go and seek them. So we'll draw up the advert, go and find the suitable candidates, draw up a short list, help you with the interview process, et cetera. So end to end, start to, we need a director to help you in, in appointing a director. And I know it's really difficult to find independent directors generally, because we tend to want to bring people onto the board that we know and they're immediately not independent or likely to be not independent. So if you're really struggling with finding suitable directors, that's absolutely happy to help. Anything else? Otherwise, um, I wish you all well and close the session. Any last questions? Great, well, thank you very much for your time. I see that several of you would like some more information about training options, happy to help. Um, we can send you the link for the direct and network as well. And I see someone's uh, looking for board, board support services. So definitely happy to have that conversation and see how we can help. Thank you very much indeed. And have an awesome Friday afternoon and a fabulous weekend. Thank you.